will by now I hope be known to you. Uh, we have Gemma Tetlow from the Institute for Government, uh, Ben Chu from the BBC and Thomas Sampson from the LSE joining us today. We also hope to be joined by the ubiquitous Jill, well she's obviously not ubiquitous because she's somewhere else and not here, uh, but by Jill Rutter who is currently uh, otherwise engaged but is going to join us I think in the next few minutes. Uh, ah, look at that, as if by magic, Jill appears. One of the, I mean, one of the greatest things about my job, apart from the fact I'd just like to announce that I was on the winning team twice in the rounders yesterday after our away day. Yep, yeah, as was Jill. Uh, I was on his team. I, it's the fact that I get to ask real experts things I'd otherwise be embarrassed to show my ignorance about and pretend I'm doing it for the benefit of the audience. And I have hundreds of questions at the moment about where our economy is. Do put your questions into Slido. Do vote for the questions you want me to ask. I see we've got a couple in already. Do please vote for them. It just makes it easier to know which ones you want me to pose. But let me start off with asking you all just a couple of questions, I think, about the economy itself and where we are. We saw some figures released today about the costs of debt servicing. And my rather simple question is, I suppose, should I be panicking? I mean, what what does this mean? What are the implications of this? Uh, and, you know, what does it mean for the economy going forward? Any volunteers? This is a cracking start. Ben. Well, I think Alan, the simple answer is no, you shouldn't be panicking. <laughs> OK, good. Um, I think it's uh, from what, um, you know, respected economists have been saying is that a lot of it is an accounting uh, measure. So there's 20 billion of borrowing in June. Uh, which is a very, very high record-breaking number, but a lot of that is a, a one-off effect on the uh, on the borrowing figures due to inflation, particularly the RPI-linked in, uh, inflation uh, uh, borrowing that we have, and it's accounted for this month uh, rather than other months. So it's not something that's going to persist. In fact, it's widely expected that it will fall down very rapidly uh, next month, and it will be a one-off hit. So it's not insignificant because that will have to be paid off at some point it doesn't it's not actually a cash flow going out this month uh the you know inflation is dangerous for the public finances if it's sustained so if we have sustained high inflation if it comes down as the projections uh most projections suggest that it will then the debt interest payments will not go into the stratosphere as that kind of very alarming one month le leap suggests uh, on the on the broader question about the economy, uh, it's a very we're in a very sort of precarious place. I would say, uh, if you look at the Bank of England's most recent forecast, they basically have zero growth over the next three years. Now that was before the Chancellor stepped in with his May package and uh, said that he would were well, committed to spending quite a lot more money uh, helping people weather the cost of living crisis. So that may help a bit. Uh, but I think in general, most economists are very, very downbeat at the moment um, about the UK's prospects and they're waiting to see whether inflation does abate and what happens with the Ukraine situation to energy, etc. And now we have sort of a, a degree of policy jeopardy as well, because we don't know what the next prime minister and their government will do on growth policy, on fiscal policy, what stance they'll take towards uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol, which could have very serious implications for the UK's trade situation. So I think there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of uh, concern about downside risks. And you're seeing that in the currency markets, you're seeing the pound under a lot of pressure. You're seeing that in the investment intention uh, uh, surveys. So it seems, I, I would say we're in a pretty precarious spot economically at the moment. And of course, households are in a very precarious spot as well, notwithstanding the Chancellor's package. Things have deteriorated since he put that package in place. It looks like there's going to be pressure for him to do more, him or her or whoever it is the next Chancellor is, to do more. So we'll, we'll wait and see what happens. But that's uh, the rough summary I would put forward. That's a really weird note on which to end, having told me not to panic. But anyway, uh, <laughs> do, does anyone else want to want to add anything to that before I ask my next sort of question that reveals my lack of knowledge? Just to add one um, small point, I mean, if Ben was getting there, the sort of the real 
threat and the, the Bank of England is trying to walk a fine line at the moment um, in bringing inflation under control because whilst the inflationary pressures were initially things that were global factors, rises in energy prices, supply chain problems around the world that are um, including because of the China's COVID lockdowns, there is a real danger that that inflation, it doesn't turn out to be temporary and instead becomes embedded. And the problem that Bank of England faces is that the UK economy is sort of pushing up against its supply constraints. In other words, people are wanting to buy more than the UK can really produce. And that's what's pushing up potentially price rises domestically, not just mm. ones coming from abroad. As the Bank of England is trying to walk this very fine line of putting up interest rates just enough to dampen down the economy to stop those inflationary pressures becoming embedded, but at the same time is trying not to do too much and push the economy into recession. So the Bank of England is walking a very fine line. At the same time, we've got the politicians wanting to protect households, but actually they can't protect all households because if they do try to do that, that will just stimulate further inflation and then the Bank of England will have to do more to offset that. So it's quite a, a difficult, yeah. uh, uncertain outlook at the moment. And I do want to come back to that distributive uh, element that you just sort of touched on in a minute, but Jill. Well, I was, I was going to come on to that actually with a bit of a question for Ben, uh, maybe for Gemma as well. Don't know about Thomas, you can answer. It's just, um, I slightly get the feeling, but maybe this is just my misperception, that the government isn't getting very much value for the interventions it's made in terms of its sort of big packages of support to people, that it doesn't seem, seems to me to have spent quite a lot of money, particularly in the Chancellor's May package, but that's almost sort of discounted entirely and has just been sort of taken in that the government needs to do more on top of that and people aren't netting those off, whether it's in pay disputes where the government's saying, you know, where people are saying, well, we're under huge pressure on the cost of living and the government's trying to sort of say, well, we've done some things on it, you're actually getting all this money so you don't need so much in terms of pay and in terms of pressure on an incoming Prime Minister and Chancellor to do more. And I think it's an interesting question about whether the packages have been well constructed from a point of view of, if you like, dampening down inflation expectations and for people feeling the effects. I was actually just looking at my bank statement to see if I could work out whether I had got my completely undeserved council tax rebate. And I can't even work that out from my bank statement. So, um, uh, I mean, I, of course, shouldn't be getting it at all. But given that I am allegedly eligible, uh, it'd be quite interesting. I just don't know whether that's whether people feel that uh, that government's spending an awful lot of money, but seems to be getting a relatively limited return um, from it. And that's actually increasing the sense of people that they are faced with something and the government's not really doing anything much to help. Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, the May seems quite a long time ago now, doesn't it? In many <laughs> many respects, I think uh, the the package that when, that he put forward was very well received by right across the spectrum. Actually, uh, a lot of people were saying he'd done a very good job at actually targeting it at the people who were most exposed, uh, and that was something he hadn't been doing before. He he finally did do so. I think you know, looking, speaking to economists before that, they were saying it's not credible that he won't act. And some of the forecasts you're getting from the Bank of England and other forecasters uh, are, are too downbeat because he will be forced to act. So I haven't seen a round of forecasts since then about talking about the, the macro impact of that May package. I suspect they will be better, but on pushing down on the other side, things have got worse on the, uh, on the energy futures markets since then. So it's hard to sort of identify how much is helped and how much it's been sort of swamped by events since then i think in terms of the general public you know what's the counterfactual if he hadn't as hadn't acted in may i think we would be seeing much more serious discontent uh yeah. from the public now and uh and in terms of the the strikes i mean that's clearly something about that's driven by the sense of unfairness from people who work in the public sector about their wage disputes um uh i don't know uh, again, I think if you'd had a combination of that with the sense that people are just being thrown to, to, to the walls, if you like, of the energy markets, things would be a lot worse. So it's really about what is your counterfactual. 
but I do, as I said before, Jill, I think, you know, the pressure is mounting for whoever is the next chancellor to put forward another package, not, not as big as the one that was in May, but certainly to top it up, to take account of the extra pressures that are going to hit households. And I think that if he does do that, you will start to see those, those impacting the, um, the uh, global, so the, the uh, UK GDP uh, forecasts as well, because they just will be large enough to do that. So nice is our audience, Jill, that we're now getting questions on Slido offering you advice about your council tax, which I'll share with you afterwards. But, <laughs> but just, I mean, the other side of this inflationary story is interest rates, isn't it? Uh, the, you know, the way you can tackle inflation is by raising interest rates. Do you think we'll come to regret not borrowing loads more when interest rates were really, really low uh, with the gift of 2020 hindsight? I, mean, I think that government plans for investment spending have now picked up a lot, but there was certainly a period of the sort of decade, most of the decade after the financial crisis, where government investment was very low by historical standards, and that definitely was a gap in not. And I think you're right that particularly at a time of incredibly low borrowing rates, the case for doing more government investment was there. Obviously, um, if we had done borrowed more for investment then, then the sort of leverage and the, the sudden increase in debt interest costs that Ben was talking about having manifested in June this year would have been that much more significant. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, yeah, certainly the case for government investment was higher when we had low interest costs. Just on that, Anand, um, in his May's lecture, Rishi Sunak was identifying what's the cause of the UK's productivity yeah. crisis and he identified low investment both public and private sector historically in that which was quite interesting now he, he, he quite cleverly said or shiftily arguably he said well you know UK uh, government investment is not the problem now because we've put it up but as Gemma was pointing out it was very low for a very long period and they did cut it substantially after the financial crisis so to hear him specifically identifying although not blaming the conservative government but identifying weak government investment as driving the uk's productivity crisis yeah. just that he agrees with the premise of your question and there's also a sort of inter interesting assumption knocking around in conservative leadership battle circles that if you cut corporation tax the money saved will go straight into investment which strikes me as quite a heroic assumption but we can come back to we'll come back to that when we talk about the leadership but thomas can i just turn to you for a sec and ask you, well, I suppose I have the liberty to ask the most basic question, what is happening with UK and global trade at the moment and how does that relate to the inflationary pressures? And while you're, while you're at it, you might as well give us our Brexit trade update. Okay, happy to, happy to do that. Um, I mean, the, the, the big picture is that after, after COVID, which was a big, initially a big negative shock to trade, there was a very strong rebound in global trade starting in the middle of 2020 onwards uh, till trade you know very quickly recovered the losses um, as a result of, of COVID. So global trade generally was performing uh, quite well. Um, there have then been some kind of initial uh, additional kind of wrinkles that have come as a result of Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine which obviously has disrupted trade in, in certain goods uh, particularly um, and I think it's fair to see you know that that disruption to supply chains, which came initially from the pressure they were put under as a result of COVID, and then as a result of the war in Ukraine, is clearly one of the big contributors to increased inflation, particularly coming from higher energy and, and, and food prices. So that you know, it's important to remember that this inflationary shock we're facing now is to a large degree a global shock. Now, the UK does have higher inflation than you know countries like Germany and France so there is a UK specific component there uh, which we also need to take account of but we, you know it, it does mirror a broader global uh, phenomenon. Uh, what's been happening in the UK with trade because obviously you know we have this additional complication of implementing the TCA and Brexit at the same time as all these other things are going on. Uh, what we saw last year was that when the new trade agreement with the EU came into force, there was a, a immediately a sharp drop in UK imports from the EU, um, maybe on the order of around 25%. So that's a really, a really big fall. So we're seeing less lower imports in the EU. Um, on the export side, uh, UK export growth has been poor for the past couple of years. 
Um, and, you know, essentially what's happened there is the UK has kind of missed out on a lot of the global upswing in trade following COVID. Why that is, is a little bit harder to disentangle in that the, the, the kind of poor UK export growth isn't overwhelmingly with the EU. It seems to be happening both for UK exports, the EU and non-EU countries. So that leaves a bit of a question about, you know, what exactly is, is causing that. But, you know, big picture, UK trade has not performed as well as, as, as other countries in the last couple of years. Brilliant, thank you. Does anyone want to add anything to what Thomas just said about trade? Uh, if we can, then I just want to turn quickly. I, I, I do want to spend some time talking about the leadership contest, but just about the sort of distributive elements of of what's happening now. You know what the prospects are for inequality going forward. I, and I, I read this morning an utterly fascinating piece in the New Statesman about how inflation uh, disproportionately affects women. Uh, talk about sort of pink inflation. It just made me think that actually we talk about this in the aggregates a lot, but what what is the current inflationary crisis doing to inequality in this country and i mean that's particularly striking i suppose given the absence of any talk about leveling up virtually during this this leadership do you think sort of inequality will increase as a result of the forces we're facing now is that going to be their immediate impact um i mean there are at least sort of three reasons to think that the current inflationary crisis is hitting lower income households at the moment more severely than higher income households. Firstly, because the types of products that are going up in price are things like food and fuel, which make up a bigger share of the budget for lower income households than for higher income households. They're just more exposed to these price rises. Mm -hmm. And they're also things where it's quite hard to cut back to any great degree on your spending on these things, the sort mm -hmm. of essential items. The second reason is that incomes are expected to go up less quickly for those at the bottom this year than those towards the top. Um, that's for a few reasons. One, if we're thinking about what are incomes like this year compared to what lower income households had last year, one factor there is the ending of the £20 a week universal credit uplift, which was in place until September last year. But also the lag that there is in when benefits get uprated by inflation means that they went up very little in April this year. And so the, the big increase in inflation that we're seeing at the moment won't feed through into benefit rates until next April. Obviously, the Chancellor did something in, in May to kind of help with that with some one-off payments. But um, wages, in contrast, will stop the distribution of, of picking up more quickly in, in light of inflation. And the third thing, um, which isn't really about incomes, but more sort of how the pain is felt, is that it was really middle and higher income households who were the most likely to have built up extra savings during the pandemic. So they, they also just have a bit more of a buffer to draw on with that extra saving. Do you want to take two minutes and plug the uh, IFG report on what policies work for levelling up while we're here? <laughs> um, yeah, very happy to. Um, yes, yeah, so we've got um, a few papers this week looking at uh, some major policy areas for levelling up um, and really concluding there that uh, some of the things that, that do work are policies around skills, although that um, the government's sort of current proposals probably don't do enough on, on higher education and early years skills. There's much more of a focus on sort of school, school age kids in the government's current plans. Um, the other major point that we're making in that is that, yes, there are big gaps in economic performance across the country, but given the scale of what the government is, one, is the sort of amount of money that's potentially out there for levelling up, the government really needs to focus its attention on a smaller number of areas rather than spreading things too thinly. If they try and spread the money everywhere, it will make very little difference um, and no obvious uh, improvement to levelling up. Good. That's a bad sign. <laughs> that's a bad omen, that is. Uh, I've got a vague... Thomas, do you want to come in? Yeah, I mean, could I just add one thing to kind of the, the points Gemma was making about the redistributionary effects of the kind of current inflation crisis, which, you know, is a series of very good points that I would agree with. The, the only thing I would add to that, and this is necessarily a little bit more speculative at this stage, is that if as a result of, of inflation, what we now see is a sharp increase in interest rates. That potentially also has additional you know, redistributionary implications in that you know, one effect of increasing in interest rates is we expect to see a fall in asset values. And that's primarily actually going to affect people towards the top of the income, and particularly the wealth 
distribution. So there is potentially one channel going in the opposite direction whereby uh, higher earning and, uh, and richer households may be harder hit. But it's, it's kind of one that we haven't really seen yet because we haven't really started to move interest rates. But if that, if that does become a factor, that will also come into play. Okay, Ben, do you want to? No, I mean, I agree with all that really. I mean, um, uh, it's interesting that I think recessions normally have the effect of reducing inequality. Uh, but this one could be the exception for all the reasons Gemma outlined about uh, the, the nature of the shock and the, the, uh, the fact that it's hitting lower income people so much more. And those, um, those earnings figures really are quite striking. The pay growth at the top is very, very high. Uh, and you can see perhaps that's one of the reasons that, well, I don't think, I haven't heard the, the union seize on that so much at, actually at the moment in making the justification for their uh, for their own pay uh, claims, but if mm. they got hold of that, I think it could get quite well. Uh, you know, it, 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 would, it would make the situation much more complicated and hard for the government to justify with pay, pay rising so high for wealthy people in the private sector to then say, you know, relatively low paid, a lot of relatively low paid people in the in the public sector, you can you need a real terms pay cut. Yeah, and there were a number of stories doing the rounds a few weeks ago about government having discussions about lifting the bonus cap in the financial services sector, which just struck me in the current context is, as you say, sort of grist to the mill of the unions. If you, you know, if you look at the pay figures, look at how much bonuses are sort of adding up in the financial services sector at the moment. And I'm, you're right, Exy, on reflection. That it, it, it's interesting that the unions don't seem to have used that. Gemma. Just to add on that, I, mean, I think there's another political challenge that the high pay growth at the top in the private sector creates to the government, which is that in recent years, what the government has tended to do is actually give a bit more generous pay rises to those at the bottom of the income scale in the public sector. But if you look at what the recruitment and retention challenges are within a lot of the public sector, actually, there's perhaps more concern about those towards the top of the distribution whose earning opportunities in the private sector have become increasingly better than what they can get in the public sector over recent years because those higher levels of pay in the public sector have been held down more. So I think there's a real political challenge for the government yeah. now that you can see why they would want to treat lower earners in the public sector more generously given the cost of living squeeze. On the other hand, it may be that the recruitment and retention challenges um, suggest you need to worry also about that higher level pay at the top end. And obviously they, they chose um, to reject one of the few pay review body recommendations they rejected this week was the 3% rise yeah. for senior civil servants giving them only 2% instead. It does strike me there's a powerful case for increasing the pay of professors but not lecturers to be honest but Jill I was just going to say that you are seeing a bit of that I think in the way they're structuring some of the pay awards that are coming through that they're if you like quite sort of lump summy which obviously means that they're compensating people more in percentage terms at the lower end so there is, does seem to be an attempt to do that the thing is that over time you would expect some of those normal differentials makes me sound like a sort of 1970s trade unionists opposed to the minimum wage, but you would over time expect to see some pressure to restore those differentials, particularly where there, you do start running into recruitment process. The government might think it's useful at the moment. It wants to cut numbers of civil service. It wants to, uh, to put a 2% cap on senior civil servants. But at the same time, one of its other policies is to expose every senior civil service post to external competition. And one of the big barriers already of people moving across people who've been successful in the private sector into the civil service, as opposed to people who have no other options, is that uh, pay is relatively unattractive. So they're just going to actually undermine another policy objective it might be that they can park that for now. And they see this primarily as a way of driving their, their sort of 91,000 cuts agenda. But... Uh, questions about the sustainability and how much you're storing up long-term pay problems for yourself or your successor. And I suppose one of the big questions haunting the whole debate is to what extent, you know, this is like an American primary where as soon as you're out of it, people will tack back uh, towards slightly different positions intended for the electorate as, as a whole rather than an electorate of 180,000, which is who they're talking to at the moment. But on that, and I, and I, do, I really don't want to spend all our remaining time dissecting Liz Truss's interview this morning, though there seems to be some appetite amongst our audience for you to tackle the claim that tax cuts reduce inflation. <laughs> so let me put that in a more neutral way. What is the relationship potentially between tax cuts and inflation? 
I mean, so I can give the textbook answer that we teach our undergraduates, which is that if you reduce taxes, that's going to increase aggregate demand and an increase in aggregate demand is inflationary. Now, then there's a huge discussion to be had about how big that effect would be and the circumstances under which that effect is bigger or smaller. But it's very hard to make the argument that um, reducing taxes reduces inflation. I mean, there, there are some taxes that you could cut, which would have a much more mechanical effect on reducing inflation. So if you cut that, for example, that would reduce measured inflation just because it's the kind of inclusive of that price that counts in that. Um, but as Thomas said, the sort of more fundamental uh, economic relationship here is that if you drive up aggregate demand, when we're in a situation where the supply capacity is, we're kind of maxing out our supply capacity anyway, then it's just putting more pressure on inflation. It's interesting, Ananda, um, the idea of, of cutting VAT was, I think, was coming from Downing Street uh, mm -hmm. a few months ago. The idea was that it would, as Gemma said, mechanically cut inflation. Is that if it was a temporary cut, it would help boost the economy and bring the measured rate of inflation down because prices would come down because that is factored yeah. in. But of course, the problem with that is that it, you, if it's temporary, it's going to come back in. So you just sort of push the inflation into the future. I mean, on, on in terms of the overall supply side argument that people like Liz Truss and Patrick Minford make, it is basically that you increase the supply capacity by encouraging investment, and that will help keep a lid on price rises. Uh, but you've got a timing problem here. Are you talking about three or five years down the line? Or are you talking this year? I don't think as Thomas said, you'll find any sort of mainstream economist who would argue that increase cutting taxes this year, is what she's saying she'd do on day one. And she's sort of implying that that would bring down inflation this morning. I don't think you'll find many takers for that at all. Ta cutting taxes and increasing spending in some areas of policy as well. Because I think she's, was she committed to 3% on defence? I'm slightly losing track of who said what at this point. That's an awful um, lot of money, it seems to me, over admittedly a 10 year period, but. And, and um, I mean, I think the one thing that you might think about would be if you really did think inflation was spiking up and then going to fall back quite dramatically, you might see advantage from the sort of thing Ben was suggesting of smoothing that by I don't know, George Osborne, when he came in, had this idea, I think, of using fuel duty as a sort of compensating mechanism to smooth out price rises. I don't think anyone worked out quite how to do it and he never did it, but he just froze fuel duty. But I think it's a bit of a sense that maybe, you know, rather than have a massive spike now, you could do something mechanical to press that spike. And I think there was a bit of thinking, you know, talking to people in the treasury about can they do any other measures that would have a sort of if you like double payoff of dealing a bit with the cost of living, but also have a positive uh, impact in dampening inflationary expectations. But that's the thing where there doesn't seem to be that much sort of, you know, established policy thinking going on about whether you should prefer measures that would do something to headline inflation rates to now to ease that off. And would that, if you're worried about getting into an inflationary price spiral, does it help if you knocked a couple of percentage points off now but then you always get the problem when you reduce indirect taxes of passing them on and we've seen that already with the chancellor taking five pence off fuel duty and then complaining that it wasn't passed on because actually it was pretty trivial in the mix of where fuel prices were generally going and would it be fair to say if you if you think that a sort of tax cutting agenda is partly linked to a desire to uh encourage business investment that actually, in order to get that business investment, you need to provide a degree of certainty for businesses because they're the conditions in which they're most likely to invest and the continued uncertainty over the TCA because of the, the continued problems over the protocol reduces that certainty and makes investment probably a bit less likely until people know where we stand. Would that be a fair thing to argue, you think? I think it would be fair to argue that kind of certainty over the economic outlook and the trading conditions and what rules and regulations are going to be will dampen uh, business investment and activity. I mean, the other thing that I struck, struck me from the election, the leadership campaign is Sunak's pledge to review all existing retained EU legislation. I mean, that seems uh, 
kind of prime way of creating great uncertainty for businesses about exactly what rules and regulations they're going to have to abide by uh, in, in producing. So, um, I mean, yes, good to uh, get rid of regulations that don't make sense, but to create that level of uncertainty for almost literally every business in the country seems potentially uh, dangerous at the moment. And also, I'd add, I'd add a couple of things to that. Firstly, it's a good idea to get rid of regulations that don't make sense, but why then say solely the ones that we've uh, that have been sort of left to us by the, shouldn't that occur, apply across the board? And my second thought when I heard him say that was, good luck with doing that and slashing civil service, service numbers, because that's quite an undertaking, but Jill. Yeah, uh, well, the government could say, because it's actually had successive goes at reducing regulation that is UK domestic, and this only Brexit has offered you the opportunity to mm. have a go at all that EU regulation, and that necessarily regulation devised for a community of 28 may not be optimal for the UK compared to regulation you would design for one. So I think the government does have a case to say, let's have a look again at that backstop. But, you know, and I since Gemma got to plug IFG's work on levelling up, I'm going to plug our excellent divergence tracker by Joel Roland and also his blog on why sunsetting everything is a terrible idea. It's a terrible idea when proposed by Jacob Rees-Mogg. It's still a terrible idea when proposed by Rishi Sunak. I think there's some interesting things, and we're about to have a blog on that uh, by Sarah Hall from Nottingham, about the government's sort of temptation to call in regulatory decisions it doesn't like, um, mm. which is one of the things that was potentially going to be in the financial services markets bill, because if you sort of undermine the quality of your regulatory regime, you and you make it a bit more politicized, a bit more random, you potentially create a, a bad business environment. But one of the things that was really interesting, I thought, was when the Chancellor Gave, um, Thomas might want to come in on this. When the Chancellor gave evidence to the Treasury Select Committee uh, a few months ago, I think on his spring statement, he conceded that there had been a dampening effect on business investment because of Brexit uncertainty until the train cooperation agreement was unsettled. You could therefore cast forward, and we've heard some rumours that he's been arguing this in Cabinet over the Northern Ireland Protocol, that something that destabilises the trade and cooperation agreement as the Northern Ireland Protocol bill definitely does, would actually have future dampening effects on business investment and probably not something you were particularly enthusiastic about at the moment when the UK looks perhaps a relatively unattractive destination for business investment compared to a UK inside the single market. Thomas, did you want to come in on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's right in the sense that there's there's fairly strong evidence that the uncertainty that was associated with all the Brexit negotiations was a factor in dampening UK business investment. And then that leads to kind of an interesting debate of, you know, if, if we think it was uncertainty that was causing low investment, when the rules are, are set, would we then expect there to kind of be a, a bounce back and the lost investment to just be delayed investment? Or is it permanently lost and not going to come come back? Now, I, I don't think we know the answer to that question yet. But clearly, any any policies which mean that even though the TCA is in place, there's still a lot of uncertainty, make it much less likely that any of the the catch up in investment will actually occur. So there's a there's a good case for trying to avoid that kind of uncertainty. Go on, Ben. Oops, sorry, I was just going to say, um, if you look at these surveys of businesses for what they're worth and mm. what they say the problem is, why they're not investing and what would change their mind, you don't find corporation tax very near the top of the list, Co the cuts in corporation tax. You find things like lack of skills, lack of available workforce, perhaps lack of demand and Brexit uncertainty. So if you listen to what businesses are actually saying, and maybe you have to take that with a bit of a pinch of salt, they're not crying out saying the big thing that's blocking us is uh, the rate of uh, corporation tax rising. Okay. I mean, this is, I suppose, more of a political, I mean, I'll, I'll pose this one to you, I think, Jill, just because we want to speculate out loud. I'm, I'm sort of torn on the uh, issue of the Northern Ireland Protocol. <laughs> But on the one hand, it strikes me that Liz Truss is possibly marginally more likely to be able to take the right of the party with her if she decides to be uh, slightly more placatory in tone with the EU and the sort of only Nixon could go to China principle. But she seems very unlikely to try to do so because she seems wedded to the protocol bill. 
And, and the opposite holds for Rishi Sunak, which is, as Jill said, we've heard all these rumours that he's the voice in Kabbada who said, we really don't want to trade war with the European Union at the moment, but he's least likely to be able to win the political argument inside his party because it seems to be that side of his party just doesn't like him at all. So what, what happens, do you think, when we get to September, Jill? No pressure. I'm... I think maybe you're the person to answer this, Anand, actually, rather than uh, me. I think it's it's very unclear. It's very unclear. I mean, you know, in a sense, you know, would the ERG have anywhere else to go if they didn't like this trust? The ERG has shown that they're prepared to defenestrate prime ministers who disappoint and, uh, you know, disappoint in different ways. Uh, and I think anybody will be looking over their shoulder because they're clearly very well organized fact I think one of the really interesting things is what does the EU do when we have a new prime minister and does it do anything that enables a new prime minister to move on um the trouble I think they would see if it's a Liz Truss prime minister is that they don't really want to signal to not least to other member states who are causing difficulties. It's not just the UK <laughs> having exited that's a problem problem for the EU, that hardball tactics, facing them down, uh, breaking rules works. So I think that would be quite difficult to, uh, to concede, even if they thought Liz Truss was potentially up for a new negotiation. I think Rishi Sunak might have a bit more room for manoeuvre to try and do something. I think they clearly might think that, you know, if he's serious about his desire for sort of proper, serious and competent government, which was one of the phrases that uh, was in his resignation letter, they might decide it's worth at least testing out whether they could do business with him because actually a sort of prolonged standoff over Northern Ireland looks to be in absolutely nobody's interest. It's not in the UK's interest. It's not in the EU's interest as it's he heading into a grim energy winter and um, certainly not in Northern Ireland's interest. So I think it's really interesting how it all plays out. But I think you're right that with the signs you know, of where the power is in the Conservative Party at the moment, uh, the EU may decide that uh, basically, it's only real tactic is to wait for another government and you'll start laying bets that another government may not be led by either Res Liz Truss or Rishi Sunak. Anyone else want to come in on this protocol? Just, we just don't know, do we, to be honest? I'm just gonna, we're just going to have to wait and see what happens in, in September. But while, while we're on Rishi Sunak, uh, it's interesting that he's sort of been cast as the kind of moderate or indeed the sort of left winger uh, in this protocol. I mean, just listening to him, it just strikes me that this is sort of a, a kind of a reincarnation of George Osborne. It's sort of dealing, you know, being careful with the public finances, uh, not maybe having rash tax cuts. It seems implicit in what he's saying is there's going to be a, a, a certain tightening of the belt, uh, which he isn't going to call austerity, but feels a little bit like it. Do you think that's fair? I mean, have I missed something? I mean, given, of course, the uncertainty about whether these people actually do what they're saying at the moment. I think his broad fiscal approach probably is quite similar to George Osborne's, and he has a set of fiscal rules that are pretty similar to the ones that George Osborne adhered to. I do wonder, and one debate we've been having amongst ourselves is the extent to which this is actually a position that all chancellors get to once they sit down with the treasury officials and get the briefing on what the economic and fiscal outlook looks like and actually suddenly all of their uh, the kind of ideological things they'd like to achieve um, don't look quite so realistic so I, I wonder whether it's partly a function of Sunak having gone through that treasury experience. Yeah just to add yeah. Anand that I think I mean everybody's focusing on the big difference on taxes but it could just be that Rishi Sunak has been through a spending review. He's already sort of forced the prime minister to put up taxes to fund this big NHS and social care thing. One of the things that all the other candidates were making very glib promises about was their ability to slash the state, slash public services by definition, or find mythical massive efficiency gains from doing things a bit differently and I think that's actually the big differentiator with Rishi Sunak that he's not just grasping for we can make the books balance by uh, slashing the state in the same way and 
partly because he's actually done a spending review and the others hadn't. So, is, I, mean, I mean, as economists, uh, I mean, the three of you who are economists, is it, is it, would it, would it be true to say, not whether you believe in what he's saying or not, I think it's the right approach, that there is at least an internal economic logic to what Rishi Sunak is saying that might not necessarily have been present amongst all the contenders for the leadership? Or is that unfair? I think that's right. The, I mean, what's, there's been a lot of debate in the uh, leadership debate about the, the, the 30 billion pounds of headroom that there is against the fiscal rules in three years time and that that's what quite a few of them were using to hypothecate their tax cuts. But actually, I think that almost misses the point that if you look to the longer term and the Office of Budget Responsibility put out their update, their sort of longer term fiscal projections a couple of weeks ago, those just suggest that the longer term picture is the pressures for more public spending for health, social care, pensions are going to outstrip the capacity of the tax system to generate revenues. Um, so actually, the idea that there is space for permanent tax cuts it just seems a bit detached from the reality of the fiscal position. And yes, stronger economic growth would make all of this much easier. And so you can see why the candidates are emphasising that. But the history of the last couple of decades suggests that there's no particularly easy answers to how to boost economic growth in the UK. So relying on that coming about very quickly to solve all your problems, I think, is a bit optimistic. Thomas or Ben, do you want to... Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that's a really important point, which is that over the medium term, my guess is that as a country, we're going to spend a lot more time talking about how we're going to fund increased expenditure on public services than about what the best way is to cut taxes. We're already in a situation where over the past decade, a lot of our public services are not now providing the quality of service that people have come to expect, particularly, you know, obviously in, in healthcare and, and education, which are big budget items. Um, and, you know, this is this is an issue that you can avoid for a few years. But at some point, there is a question of do you want to continue funding public health care and, and public education at, at levels that kind of provide people with what they expect. And if, if that is going to be the case, I think that's going to require tax increases because, you know, those things are becoming a, a bigger share of overall spending. They're expensive. How do we how do we pay for that? And that's, you know, that's not a debate that we're having at all at the moment. And I think that's mm. that, that's a problem. And from a political science point of view, I mean, it really does strike me that having this sort of frequency of political crises means that political time horizons, which are already ridiculously short in terms of having sort of rational medium term policies, have just been appallingly compressed. Uh, so all of a sudden, you know, coming out of this electoral campaign, the political time horizon is two years. You know, we have to make things look like they're working for two years and we'll deal with what happens after two years and one day when we get there, if we're still in charge. And, and that it just seems to be a real structural problem now that this this problem is getting more and more marked and the instability within our parties uh is making it very very difficult to even think about i mean i always used to joke during the sort of brexit wars that the sort of medium term strategy meant friday uh and anything longer than that was a total waste of time there's a real sense of that however i don't want to move away from this particular conversation without honing in on the the treasury is to blame for everything that ever goes wrong line for which I'm going to turn to Jill. There's been a lot of talk by some candidates about institutional change, breaking up the Treasury. Can you just talk us through what the rationale for that, what, what people had in mind and what the rationale is for that sort of uh, proposal? So it's been knocking around for quite a long time. So uh, the thinking is that there are other countries which separate out two functions that the Treasury says it joins. If you look at the sort of Treasury uh, website, the Treasury strap line, it's, you know, we are the UK's economics and finance ministry. And one of the things that a lot of the critics of the UK's growth performance say is the problem with the UK is the finance ministry repeatedly wins out over the economics ministry bit of the Treasury, and that we are very short termist, the Treasury, we heard this from the Prime Minister yesterday, Treasury doesn't like building things and like investing in infrastructure. Gemma was saying that throughout the 2010s, the Treasury didn't take the opportunity of very low interest rates to invest, you could say, update necessary infrastructure and things like that. Uh, 
you know, we outsource quite a lot of thinking about business, which in Germany would be in the Wirtschaftsministerium, the Economics Ministry, to the Business Department, which the Treasury holds in a degree of contempt uh, most of the time and doesn't take very seriously. Uh, we had under Gordon Brown an attempt to beef up with these, and we mentioned the productivity teams and things like that. But you, know, you could say over the last 12 years, uh, maybe the finance ministry side has been in the ascendancy. So what's your answer? We had one answer from Dominic Cummings slash Johnson, which was to merge the advisor units, the issue that Sajid Javid resigned over to say, well, actually we will use the advisor network, Cummings, whatever, create a joint unit. They will effectively achieve a reverse takeover of the treasury from number 10. You could say that actually, effectively, those people just moved in to beef up the Treasury slightly more and the Treasury won out, but everything was sort of swept to pieces by the near simultaneous emergence of the pandemic as the dominant issue to deal with over the next uh, next period. Uh, and certainly, you know, spending money didn't become a big constraint in the Treasury over that period. Um, so Kemi Badenoch, uh, maybe a, a leader of the future, depending on how the next bit goes, proposed effectively to create what she called an office for economic growth in number 10, a sort of special unit that would be driven by the prime minister to drive the growth agenda. There've been other attempts. The most notable one was Harold Wilson with George Brown to create the Department of Economic Affairs. Um, Rishi Sunak does have a mission of government to change, but it's not about the treasury. It's about the business department to hive off and create a new energy department. The one thing I would have said to Kemi Badenoch, uh, whose idea I think I would have probably put in the bit, bet, bit bats camp in the long term is you don't want to spend your two years, quite short time window, entering the mother of all machinery of government battles with arguably the government's most powerful department, because if you want anything that is going to scupper your prime ministership from the get go, it's probably that because the Treasury will be fighting for its institutional survival. Um, but that's the sort of thinking, is how can you sort of rebalance between economics and finance ministry, uh, and is does it have to be broken up? So other people do that, have ministries of finance and economics departments. Um, you know, some thoughts of the, doing the reverse, taking the Office of Management budget sort of thing and putting that in there. We had a bit that Francis Maud with the creation of what was called the Efficiency Reform Group in the Treasury, because he said the Treasury's only interest in making numbers add up. It's not really interested in value for money in the way in which government does its business. So there are a variety of critiques and your machinery of government change can follow that critique. But I think it's a brave prime minister that takes on the institutional might of the Treasury and a chancellor in place. Um, because Chancellor in place is sort of the Treasury Act, a bit of institutional drag anchor there. And once Chancellors discover they've got all those levers in the Treasury, they'll be quite reluctant to get go, to let go. I think that's what they call institutional memory, what we've just heard. Uh, <laughs> does anyone else want to chip in on this sort of institute? Ben? Yeah, I don't know what the um, the structural answer is. It's fascinating to hear Jill outline well, the, the case, but I do think... I would say that a lot of people in, in recent years would, would agree that there, there is a problem there with the short termism of the Treasury in terms of uh, its approach and blocking investments, which most economists on the outside would say, well, actually, those are pretty sound investments for the future. I mean, if you just look at two of this, this government's big flagship policies, net zero and levelling up, Mm -hmm. If you look, the, 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 I would say the consensus is that they are very underfunded by the Treasury in terms of public expenditure about what's going to be necessary. And you can see some of this critique coming in from the OBR. You can see it coming from the Climate Change Committee, specifically on uh, retrofitting housing and decarbonising the UK domestic housing stock. The, the Treasury is just simply not committing enough public funds to make that a reality, to get all those heat pumps into homes. And if you look at the levelling up agenda, well, we all know how much Germany spent in order to level up with the East after the reunification. There's just not that level of financial commitment to make this, what a lot most economists would say was, is a sound goal, levelling up economically. It's a good way of unlocking a lot of productivity for the UK. Mm -hmm. The Treasury is just not behind it institutionally. And to pick another recent example, the schools catch up uh, investment that was called for by Kevin Collins. A lot of 
outside economists looked at these numbers and said, actually, this is a good spend. This is a justified because of the gains you'll get in the future and the Treasury institutionally, we gather, was, was blocking that. So I think you've got two, three very salient examples very recently of where actually this is slightly dysfunctional, this, this, this institution is acting as a bar on, on what most people would say is actually justified capital investment spending. I think, you know, I, as I say, I'm not sure what the institutional answer is to this, but clearly where you, a place you want to get to is you, you want to have that investment happening in a disciplined way. How can you get set up the institutional arrangements where you it isn't just a free for all because you, the Treasury is right that you've got to keep control of public finances, but how can you invest but do it in a disciplined way. Uh, that's the place we've got to get to and I think, as I say, the, the view I would say amongst the economists I speak to is that uh, yes, that there is reform needed here. Is it is it fair to attribute this to the Treasury I mean, listening to you I just thought well that's <clears throat> everything you've said. Is inherent in the nature of adversarial politics under first past the post that time horizons are necessarily going to be short that prime ministers need to deliver before the next election that part of the functioning of our politics implies that the new lot coming in part of their objective is to undo some of what the old lot did i mean it's been very very interesting listening to policy debates over the last 15 years or so <clears throat> i don't think i've ever heard so many calls for a cross-party approach whether it's social care or climate crisis or whatever, people talk that talk a lot with no sign whatsoever of such an approach ever uh, emerging. So I think <clears throat> at one level, people get the need for sort of medium term policies for things that aren't just there for a parliamentary term. But I wonder whatever you did with the Treasury institutionally, whether the dynamics of politics is going to maintain this sort of short termism. Well, just the thing, I think those those policies of net zero and levelling up <coughs> coming from the prime minister. I I'm not sure it's a sort of, you know, uh, quite the problem of short termism from the leadership. I think I think in those examples, it was the institutional block of the Treasury rather than right. anything to do with okay. the electoral timetable. But perhaps Jill has a different view. Uh, I'm. I would say I think there was a real timing set of issues on both net zero and levelling up because the government did a spending review and then produced after that its net zero strategy and its levelling up strategy. That is not a sensible way of doing government. If these are going to be your big flagship programmes that you're really going to invest in, you do though, you actually do those as an integral part of your multi-year spending review to say, actually, we want to do this, we're going to spend serious money on these. And then you work out, you know, you could say the Treasury is too restrictive about the size of the fiscal envelope and how much you're prepared to invest overall, which is a different sort of argument to be having. But within that, you would say that, you know, it's one of the big arguments about levelling up. Was there any new money? And Michael Gove was forced back to say, well, yeah, we did bits of this in the spending review. But you should have actually made those two of the big cross-cutting themes. You know, there was a bit of that on net zero of, you know, we are going to ensure that these big ambitious programmes are properly funded and think through the consequences for taxation, for borrowing uh, and for other spending programmes. I mean, the problem at the moment is that the way we do spending is almost, you know, we give the, you know, we dedicate over, you know, whatever the NHS sort of seems to need to keep stuttering on. Uh, and then we fund benefits and then we sort of work out where the sort of other crumbs go. Um, but certainly on the investment side, we certainly should have done that up front in the spending review. And you may actually want to do something like have a sort of cross government investment committee uh, that you actually sort of think about where as a government are we going to put in big money, do big capital projects. But the trouble is everybody goes back into their sort of departmental <laughs> silos. So it's quite difficult to get proper cross-government things without strong leadership from number 10. And maybe that Kemi Badnock's right in the sense that you need to gear up number 10 to be able to drive that a bit better. I'm just not sure that taking it away from the Treasury is going to end up as a good thing. But um... Gemma? I was only, I mean, I totally agree with you there, Gemma. I suppose my only question given the context of the question, which is sort of how much fault should be laid at the Treasury's door for some of this, is if you had a Treasury that really believed in these longer term agendas and wanted to play a more constructive role in achieving them, 
would the Chancellor have pushed for those strategies on net zero and levelling up to have actually been put together before the spending review and then factored into that rather than done afterwards, which doing it afterwards, as you say, kind of increases the Treasury's ability to just say, well, there's no new money, so sort it out. So, I mean, so it seems to me there, there, there are, t sorry, Thomas, did you want to come in? Sort of. It seems to me there are two strands of critique going on simultaneously in this leadership contest. One is kind of institutional, which we've dealt with. And I don't know whether we should talk about the criticisms that we made of the Bank of England as well during this contest, which have been quite interesting. Maybe we'll come back to that. But the other, the other strand is sort of cognitive, isn't it? Which is, you know, all these treasury slash FT slash whoever else economists with their group think basically can't think outside the box and are simply intellectually because of this group think not up to the challenge of the sort of unique circumstances of our time. I'm not quite sure how to phrase the question out. Of, I mean, is there an element of truth to this? I mean, is there a sort of herd mentality at work here? Is there a, a new orthodoxy out there that it might be worth trying that people in the treasury just are, are too sort of brainwashed to even consider? I, mean, I guess if you wanted, to, I mean, I, I'm going to defend oh, the Treasury are all slightly. Exercise now. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, someone, I, I've, I mean, I've never kind of worked at the, at the Treasury, so I'm independent in that sense. But if you wanted to think of an example where, you know, Treasury arguably did think outside the box and come up with a policy that seems to have been quite successful, you'd point to the furlough scheme, yeah. um, and, you know, the, which was drawn up extremely quickly at the start of the uh, pandemic. And it's probably fair to say played a major role in helping smooth the adjustment of the economy through that process and in avoiding a situation where we ended up with mass unemployment. So, I, and I think that's a good example of where you know Treasury did manage to come up with what was at the time a you know a fairly novel uh, policy. Um, so, you know, on on that front, there clearly is scope to innovate. Um, then again, you know, you could also look at other examples of policies during the crisis. So if you look at something like you know, Eat Out to Help Out, um, which also came out of the Treasury and was uh, was less successful. So there isn't kind of, an, you know, any department is going to have some policy successes and, and failures, but I'm not sure it can necessarily put down to sort of a, a group thing that prevents, prevents even the possibility of coming up with new ideas. This idea of group thinking, Anne, I mean, it, it, it does sort of take us back to the, you know, the referendum in 2016, where the accusation is basically, there's a consensus on one side that uh, of this will be the economic impact of this thing that's being proposed. And the answer is, well, you're all subject to group think. Well, the answer is, you know, the natural effects of, well, that's, what's the evidence then? Let's talk about what the evidence shows. And then if the people who are accusing you of group think are not able to provide any any evidence at all or any compelling evidence that there's mm -hmm. that the what you're said what the group is saying is wrong then you kind of don't really um don't really buy it and i think it's similar situation with this idea on tax cuts or radical supply side reform Let, let's see the evidence that it can have the transformative effects and then we'll debate that rather than you're all brainwashed and you're all subject to group things uh, that, that's the way i think about those kind of accusations at least Gemma. Yeah, I just I was going to say similar point to Ben, really. I think the looking at what's being said in the leadership debate, there seems to be a notion, as Ben said, that there is kind of easy answers, easy tax cuts, easy policies that just haven't been tried yet that would solve all the problems. And I think, yes, it's good to challenge yourself and think, are we looking at all the evidence? But I think it's it, it's a bit too convenient to think that there's just this answer out there that the group thing within the Treasury has been ignoring for all this time. And I would hope that new government coming in would look seriously at the evidence before launching down a path that might not deliver what they hope it will. I mean, it is, I'll come to you in a second, it is yeah. it's curious and worrying to me that, you know, one of the things it's very, very hard to say in politics these days is it's complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, that just doesn't seem to be acceptable, but Jill. I mean, I would say that there is, maybe it's alternative groupthink, I and mean, there's quite a lot of groupthink among economists, if you go back to the Millie's review, of there are potential ways of doing a radical restructuring of the UK tax system that could potentially unlock quite big efficiencies or uh, dial down some of the big 
inefficiencies that a brave chancellor and a radical government might want to take and you know and things like addressing property taxation you know rethinking the way we tax corporates and stuff like that and there are sort of quite a lot of ideas out there and treasury officials uh you know can always come up with ideas about let's remove loads and loads of you know reliefs allowances go you know the sort of thing that the new zealanders australians did in the 1980s new zealanders when they were forced to restructure their economy uh, when they were sort of finally, finally had to confront the effects of the UK joining the common market in the 1970s and realised they couldn't go on living behind a protectionist wall anymore. So there are sort of quite radical ideas out there. They're not just reduce your headline rate of income tax into a sort of narrower thing. Uh, yeah. So there are sort of options that are quite well researched out there. Uh, but I think, as you say, that would take a very brave prime minister and chancellor, particularly two years out from an election, to say that's the route I'm going to go to now. Okay. In amongst the questions, which now, in addition to Jill's tax advice, also includes a bit of praise for Ben's work as a journalist, which we won't go into, but congratulations, Ben. Uh, there are some questions about uh, the Labour Party here, and I suppose we'd better mention. Do you have a, do any of you have a sense of what Labour's economic policy would be? If they came into power this week, which they obviously won't. But I mean, what 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 are what are the key dividing lines? What 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 does Labour stand for on the economy? Is that is that clear? I think um, from what I've picked up, at least, uh, it would involve more capital expenditure on green infrastructure. Uh, yeah. I think that made a lot of Rachel Rees has made a lot of that pledge. She's made a lot of uh, play about fiscal discipline. Uh, we've um, fiscal rules which look pretty much identical as far as I can tell to what uh, Rishi Sunak had so that may be a point of differentiation if those rules go out of the window um, I think uh, I think you know the general tone of it I would argue is probably more spending on public services uh, while also saying no to certain calls for uh, more spending in certain other areas but with a special carve out for uh, environmental spending that would be my view, but I, it's a good question because it, it hasn't got the definition that uh, many would like it to have at this stage. Mm -hmm. and, I, and actually, that, that would be part two of my question for the others. I mean, for, answer part one as well, by all means. But is it fair to be asking that question? Because, of course, the response you get from Labour is we're not writing our manifesto yet. No one would expect us to write our manifesto yet. Wait till we write our manifesto and all those questions. Uh, is, I can re never remember the last part. <laughs> but is, it, is it too soon? Is it unreasonable to expect them, their policies to be better fleshed out by now? Yeah, I think we wouldn't really expect the opposition party to have a fully fleshed out set of proposals yet. And in a way, why would they spell that out right now? Because it just opens them up to being challenged and that turning out to be the, the wrong prescription. Um, so I think probably not. It's not that unusual. Um, of course, it's the challenge for opposition parties to develop those policies is just the much much smaller resources that they have to draw on whereas the government of the day had, has armies of civil servants to yeah. do research and suggest options to them the opposition parties are obviously having to do this with a much much smaller team and much more reliant on outsiders whose expertise they can draw on i mean generally sort of lying to people anyone writing a manifesto is above all avoid commitments that will limit your room for maneuver or whatever, whether it's things like triple locks or, you know, commitments not to raise things and stuff like that, that you'll need to maximise your scope for flexibility. So the longer you can go without making clear commitments, it's probably going to make your life easier inside government. I mean, what I think that an opposition has to do at this stage is to make clear when the government is addressing things, you know, what different framework it would bring to dealing with the problem that the government is currently grappling with and how its principles and approach would be different and in their views better uh, than the government's one, which I think we've seen a bit of in the response to the energy crisis from Labour, uh, rather than sort of pitching forward, slightly because there are so many unknowns, because if you look at inflation, there are a whole range of inflation possibilities that are possible by the time of the next election, depending on whether you know we have conflict with China, depending on whether we have uh, whether we the Ukraine war is going on or has been resolved in some way and things like that. So there's huge amounts of uncertainties about what the preoccupations will be. 
back in that time. I mean, it's interesting. Yesterday in the office, we were having a quick chat before Jill and I went on to triumph on the rounders pitch, if I haven't mentioned that before. Uh, just about <clears throat> uh, the period 2008, 2010, when you had a global financial crisis, but the Conservatives were incredibly effective at making Labour partly responsible for what was happening, despite the fact that the crisis was global. And it crossed my mind that actually, if you look at what's happening now, we have a global inflationary crisis. And the work of Thomas and others points to the fact that one of the reasons why our inflation rates are slightly higher than others is because we've incurred additional costs because of trade barriers and the like. And I, I, should Labour be making more of that? I mean, I understand the dangers. I mean, I understand you don't want to be sort of Captain Remain or whatever, so it doesn't necessarily have to be Keir Starmer himself, but it does strike me that given the evidence that is accumulating, that whatever the political benefits and the sort of sovereignty benefits, there are short-term economic is issues here. Do you think Labour are missing a trick by not linking the current crisis to, to decisions taken by this government uh, rather than just going along with this as a global thing that everyone's experiencing? My impression, Anand, is that Labour are quite big on the focus groups. So I suspect they'll have quest asked the question, what, what message would people be receptive to hearing about the economy? Would they be receptive, as you say, to a message that the government did Brexit and this is the response? Or, or, or do they want to hear that Labour are economically competent and we can trust them with our money? I'm guessing that the results would lean towards the latter rather than the former, which is why they're following it. But I have no specific knowledge. I think I think Labour does Both have those a things can be true, can't problem. they? Sorry? Both those things can be true simultaneously. There's no Yeah, that is true. But uh, um yes, I think uh, I, I think it's clear from the direction of what they're that they're standing that they they at least are calculating that the biggest job or the primary job is not to say that the government has messed it up because it's Brexited, but more to show that they uh, are economically and fiscally competent and could be trusted with your money. Thomas, did you want to? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think it's interesting, as as Ben says. Obviously, Labour has made a decision not to talk about Brexit. They've decided that's the kind of politically optimal policy for them to to follow. Um, and it's certainly not for me to provide them any political advice. But you know, what would be interesting is you know if they do win the next election, then they will come into government and actually be faced with making decisions about what to do about uh, EU policy. And we've had some signs recently about what their thinking is mm -hmm. along those lines. Mm -hmm. The very clear pledge Keir Starmer has made that Labour would not be rejoining the single market um, or the customs union, but at the same time would be looking to have a more cooperative and productive relationship with the, with, with, with the EU. I guess what, what worries me about that approach is that certainly if you believe the economic consensus, the main costs from Brexit are not about the fact that, you know, we have a sort of slightly, we have an antagonistic relationship outside the single market of the customs union. It's about whether you're a member of the single market of the customs union. So, at, you know, at some point, there's going to be a dilemma, which some government will have to grasp, which is that if you want to, to improve the, you know, to, to, to realize the economic gains that possibly could come from a stronger relationship with the EU, the way you do that in a significant way is you rejoin the single market and you rejoin the customs union. And I don't think the debate that we're having at the moment has really kind of takes that point seriously. Everyone still just doesn't want to talk about the issue at the moment. But is, isn't that precisely because the economic gains are highest at the precise point where the political costs are the highest? Uh, and, and, and that's the problem is... Yeah, I mean that's undoubtedly the trade off. The tr the, tr the trade off that it exists, um, but it, it it does mean that you know at least when we're talking about the economics at the moment, the whole degree, the whole debate kind of has a degree of unreality to it. The sense yeah. that simply you know by doing some twiddles around the edges of the TCA, there are going to be major economic effects. I don't think anyone actually believes that. So then there's a question: is there is there something Labour could do that would actually realise? you know, realise some economic gains from its relationship with the EU, and so far they haven't really managed to articulate that. And that, that might be a partial explanation for what I'd posed as a puzzle, which is, you know, Labour aren't going to major on this because the proposals such as they are aren't going to make much of a material difference in, 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 in economic terms. So if the question were posed, what would you do instead, the offer is quite thin and economic. Um, 
I mean, Anand, you can have sort of, you could potentially realise sectoral gains on something like a veterinary agreement or, yeah. you know, alignment of SBS rules, which farmers and, you know, agri-food exporters would probably like. You can do something to help the people who've been hit particularly badly uh, by the lack of a mobility agreement. Go back to that, which was allegedly on offer if you're less hung up on some of the stuff on borders you could do some of the things that have inflicted damage through unilateral decisions like the thing we talk about about school exchanges by allowing kids to come in with id cards so there are sort of bits which will not have very not shift the macro dial very much but will make a difference in terms of easements for sectors but if you want to stop short of the single market and customs union and yet sort of do a much closer relationship with sort of alignment. Basically, Keir Starmer is saying, you remember that nice checkers deal, that nice Mrs. May was floating around that you told her was rubbish cherry picking. I'm a nice extra person. You know, can I have some of that? And I think there's no sign that the EU is going to see any particular merits for itself in going back and doing something. Uh, which helps the UK and even the checkers deal did nothing for the UK's services industries yes. um, and the EU is you know UK is now diverging off and Labour seems to be supporting the idea that the UK would have a sort of different approach to financial services so it's the other big sort of area once you've done those things. Gemma did you want to? I don't have anything to add thanks. Because I've completely forgotten what the question was anyway but actually just on what Jill was just saying I was very struck we had David Lammy at a conference a few weeks ago and just, just, he, we, we reacted a little bit strongly, I think. When I, so he gave this talk about how we're gonna have closer relations with, with the EU. And my first question to him was, so David, you must be really kicking yourselves for not voting for Mrs. May's deal because actually this was everything you want uh, with the potential of dividing the Conservative Party into the bargain. I mean, uh, and he didn't like that at all. I'm not sure that's... Uh, do... Uh, there's a lot of questions here that are basically, you know, why why are we why do we want to waste our time listening to what the candidates are saying, because no one means what they're saying at the moment. Uh, I'm not sure how we turn that into. I mean, as analysts, <clears throat> let me put it this way: as analysts, are you spending a lot of time now looking at what's being said, thinking about what it might mean in practical terms, thinking about costing it? because you think this is what's going to be happening to the economy in September? Or are you saying to yourself, you know what, just like Jill and I just said about the protocol, let's just have August off and think about it in September when decisions are being made? I think personally, Alan, I would divide it into different uh, buckets of proposed policies. You know, the tax stuff, which Liz Truss said she would do from day one, I take pretty seriously if she mm -hmm. was to be elected. I think you have to cost that. The stuff she's saying, for instance, about the Bank of England, you said we come on to that about uh, it's so vague and it's yeah. so implausible in terms of imagining what she would actually do in terms of right I'm going to make the Bank of England less independent it's very very hard to see anyone doing that at least uh, you know do you know what I mean or, or messing, messing around with the mandate in such a way that it destabilizes the regime we've had since 1997 so mm. I think you know I think you distinguish between the pledges some are harder than others I don't think you certainly you don't take them all equally seriously uh, as yeah, an analyst okay. as, as a journalist I would say you focus on ones you've got to use your political antenna what's what is more likely to happen and also what is more likely to affect people's lives as well you know uh, yeah yeah you, yeah that has to be weighed I think in the balance and Gemma, I can put that question to you in a slightly different form, I suppose, which is as you were releasing all your levelling up stuff, was it with a sinking feeling that actually come September, <laughs> this isn't going to be talked about anymore? Yeah, I mean, certainly that we've been listening to what's being said and thinking about this. Um, and I think sort of looking at Sunak's behaviour as Chancellor it doesn't feel that perhaps he was quite as brought into the levelling up agenda as mm. the Prime Minister might have been. On the other hand, I mean, the other thing that's been sort of going round in our minds is the thought that, well, if the Conservative government totally drop this, then this is clearly a policy that Labour can pick up and say, well, the Tories no longer care about boosting circumstances outside London and South East. So for that reason, I sort of, I, I can't see it completely disappearing as a policy agenda for the government that this issue of improving living standards outside London and South East is probably going to remain on the agenda 
even if not. Um, but otherwise, I'd agree with um, Ben's statement. I think there are some there are some of the things that we sort of are taking seriously and thinking about how will we gear up for what what's the outlook on tax changes. I think if it's Sunak, we may be more back in the world of what he announced at the March budget, which was more of his plan to review business taxation. Uh, if it's trust, then it's much more likely to be big headline cuts in tax rates. Um, on the flip side, I think there are various issues that are likely to face the next prime minister, regardless of who it is. And they're not things that they will be talking about in this ele uh, election campaign, but things like potential for further rises in energy prices and supply problems with Russia, cost of living crisis for the reasons that we said earlier that um, energy prices are probably going to rise even more than was expected back in May. So there might be, I think there are a bunch of important issues that will be kind of there regardless of who gets elected. Thomas or Jill? I'd say that we can take August off because we're just random sort of pundits and commentators, but people in Whitehall will be getting together there sort of briefing packs to hold potentially a whole slew of new incoming ministers and we probably expect quite a lot of change at cabinet level as well which will affect some of these we've just focused on the leaders but one of the things people will be doing and could I just make one prediction you could backdate your tax changes to day one but you can't cut them on day one actually even a sort of very short emergency statements going to take you a bit of time to pull together. So I don't think Ben needs to be ready to cover that the moment that uh, Liz Trust takes over. I would, you know, earliest might be the next week if she got her skates on. So there will be lots of work going on in Whitehall trying to say which of these pledges do we need to take seriously, uh, which do we think are seriously misguided and we'll need to work out uh, what advice we give our incoming minister, what will work. And as Gemma said, what will we need to say? You need to think about these things, even though you don't want to. Thomas. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess as, as an academic, I have the, uh, I'm fortuitous enough to not necessarily have to think about these things until they actually come into, in, into play. Um, from my end, I think, you know, for, for the work I do, which is primarily on trade, thinking about what the implications are for the Northern Ireland Protocol and whether there's a risk we end up in a trade war with the EU is the kind of uh, the, the most salient issue. And I think there's still far too much uncertainty o o over that to really draw any definitive conclusions at, at this point. But it will be interesting to kind of watch going forward where we do end up in our trade relations with the EU. I don't know. I think Jill and I are pretty definitive about what's going to happen with the protocol. Uh, <laughs> Oh God, I've failed you all. We've run out of time. We haven't gone, we haven't done uh, the Bank of England. But I mean, the highest praise I can give you a lot is that for about a few hours after these events every time, I actually tell myself I understand economics a little bit. Uh, and that I have to say is, is no mean feat. And I hope we can have you all back in the autumn around what will be some kind of fiscal event, I suppose, uh, to do this again. One final plug actually, before I forget, which is we're putting together with full fact a little publication that looks at 10 of what we think are the key areas of public policy being debated in this leadership contest just trying to set out some of the salient facts that you probably should be aware of and are sometimes not being made as clear as they should be and i'm reluctant to do this but i'm going to do it anyway it should could be out towards the end of next week with a tailwind and everyone producing on time. So look out for that because I think it might be quite a useful thing to look at in the context of the current leadership debate. But for now, thank you all so much. I really enjoyed that. It's good of you to take the time as always. If I don't see any of you beforehand, have a lovely summer. <laughs>